So hi guys. Uh, today our speaker is Professor Julian Sonar from University of Geneva. He's going to speak about uh, chaos and ergodicity in quantum gravity. This is uh, 103 number of Zoominar in this series. Um, and uh, thanks Julian for agreeing to give this talk for this QSTM forum, which we are continuing for long. And uh, I'm hopeful that students and all of us can able to learn a lot of things regarding chaos and ergodicity from you. So you can start. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's, it's a very nice idea to have these seminars. Uh, I'm impressed that it's already number 103 and may there be many more. <laughs> so um, let me tell you um, briefly what is the plan. Sorry, I <coughs> started in the worst possible way. <clears throat> okay. So um, I, I'm kind of flexible in terms of where I spend most of the time. So that will depend also on um, where you want me to go. So please feel always free to interrupt or to ask for clarifications in particular directions. But I do want to roughly, I want to start with sort of uh, explaining um, very in very basic terms, what actually is the issue regarding unitarity versus semi-classical gravity. Because this is actually really in some sense, the main uh, physical reason why we've been thinking about chaos and ergodicity um, in recent years. So very semi-classical gravity. Okay, this is some um, basic things that I will re review for you. Um, then um, actually the, the main point of my talk uh, will be spent on thinking about um, how uh, this unitarity restoration or how, how these requirements of unitarity are actually met if we uh, think about the quantum ergodic regime of gravity. So I would like to talk about basically uh, quantum chaos first somewhat generally, and then quantum chaos and in particular ADS CFT, right? And this will basically tell me about, let's say, spectral tell us about spectral correlations. I will of course define exactly what that means. Um, and how these relate to wormholes. And um, well, we'll see how far um, I get with um, applications and examples of these ideas. And uh, of course there will be some conclusions or outlook. Okay, so let me start. So let's go to uh, this issue of unitarity. So what I will ask once at least, uh, is it readable so far? It's big enough and, and so on. Yeah, it's visible, everything is visible. Yeah. Excellent. So um, <clears throat> as you have already uh, probably uh, surmised, the focus of these lectures is on discussions in the ADS-CFT context. And I want to think about black holes in ADS basically. Because we have this uh, um, ADS-CFT duality, we can actually come up with a very sharp version of Hawking's paradox. So let me explain that to you. Basically, this is due to Maldacena, right? So let me uh, not write uh, too many people's names uh, just so I don't write uh, endlessly, but it, this, this version of Hawking's paradox is basically due to Maldacena. It all starts with the observation. This, of course, we have to thank Hawking for that the black hole entropy itself is a finite quantity. So this is the area of the horizon 
uh, in you know suitable units divided by four times g newton, and this is a finite quantity. Okay, so in other words, we can say that the dimension of the Hilbert space that is associated to the black hole, so some fixed energy or microcanonical Hilbert space, also should be finite. And um, so putting together now the finiteness or maybe the local at finite energy finiteness of the Hilbert space and unitarity actually gives um, sharp signatures. So we should look for sharp signatures. Uh, of unitarity or the lack of unitarity, of course. Um, in such quantum systems. So let me call them in, uh, you know, dimension, Hilbert space of the black hole, uh, less than infinity quantum systems. Okay, and um, two particularly uh, um, useful ones. So these, these start becoming, you know, very down to earth quantities. So one of them is let's look at the two point function of some operator. So the two point function of some operator, um, for example, let's define just to have written something, G of T will be the trace with respect, for example, even to the canonical density matrix of some operator O dagger of T, O of zero. So literally the two point function where we could think of rho as the canonical density matrix e to the minus beta h. So h is the Hamiltonian of our system, beta the inverse temperature, or actually usefully also we can think of it in terms of some um, pure state psi. So here, this is, the, this is the density operator for some pure state psi. So psi would be some sort of finite energy density, uh, energy density state, but it's a pure state. Um, okay, so this, this the, the, the point is that we can think about this in the context that will be interesting signature of unitarity or lack thereof, both in the case where we consider um, an ensemble or a pure state. Now, um, secondly, a second probe, uh, one that is actually in some sense cleaner and that's quite related to the first probe is uh, the, what, what people like to call the spectral form factor. And of course, I will tell you what are the signatures of unitarity in these two quantities. I just want to introduce them both before we move on. So the spectral form factor, often people like to write it as K of T. Um, and it is essentially a pure sum over phases. So it's going to be the sum over the spectrum. So I, J label, let's say the energy eigenvalues of my Hamiltonian. And then um, I have a finite temperature E to the minus beta. I look at the sum of eigenvalues and then I have a term which has a basically time dependence T in the usual way and with the difference of eigenvalues EI minus EJ. And there's actually many ways of motivating the spectral form factor. Um, one way of motivating it from our current, uh, from our current uh, perspective is let's say we really are uh, interested in this very natural quantity, the two point function. If we actually look at it in terms of a spectral decomposition then the two point function because of the time evolution of the Heisenberg operator will have this factor. And because of the presence of, let's say the canonical density matrix, it will have this first factor. And then the two point function will also have uh, dependence on the actual matrix elements of uh, the operator. And so in some sense, from this perspective, the spectral form factor um, covers um, some, in some sense, um, essential aspects of the two-point function without having to know anything about the matrix elements of the operator. So it is a clean property in some sense of the, what is going on in terms of the spectrum in these kind of quantities. And so it's a, it's a natural quantity from that point of view, but we shall see also as the lecture goes on um, other perspectives um, that basically tell us that this is a very sensitive probe of the spectrum. I hope that by the end of these lectures, I mean, I will certainly tell you a story about the spectral form factor. I hope that I will also be able to tell you a recent story about two-point functions of operators 
um, which is, as I said, slightly more complicated because we will need to know something about the matrix elements of operators. So for now, let me therefore think about the spectral form factor. And okay, let me just say, um, often people also like to think of this as the analytically continued partition function. So that's maybe technically a, a useful thing to say. So you can think of it as something like Z, uh, Z of beta plus it, and then Z star of beta minus it. And so Z is just the usual partition function. And so now, um, what we want to look at is we want to look one at question, uh, one question. Once you yes, please. Uh, once you express in terms of partition function, don't you need to uh, like uh, take the ensemble average kind of thing? No, I don't need to necessarily take the. Certainly, the definition. If, uh, the definition is just an equality. Okay. 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 Um, okay. So. Uh, so we can derive uh, stringent constraints. I think this second term we would not be Z star because you have already written beta minus I. Well, I think that's just notation. Most people do write it as such a thing. They write Z star of beta minus I T here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so, so we, we look for stringent constraints. Um, on the late time behavior. Of, uh, of this K of T now, uh, of course, G of T would also be of interest and there are other quantities, but let's now focus on K of T. Okay, so um, in particular, uh, to do so, let's consider uh, something like um, an average, but it will be a time average, not, not like Sayantan suggested right now, um, an ensemble average. So for now, let's, let's think about a time average. And uh, that will be um, just the integral over some time interval zero to capital T. Oh, why am I calling it F? Um, let me call it, K, and maybe I will call this guy here K beta of T, okay? Because I'm going to write this depends also on, on beta. Okay, so, so this will be the, um, yeah, this will now be the average of, uh, sorry, I'm just realizing that this notation is going to be bad. So let me just call this K beta and there is no, there is no, argument because I'm going to just average K beta of T over some time interval uh, capital T, okay? And formally uh, to make this late time, let us consider the limit that T goes to infinity, okay? Then of course uh, we can just do it, right? The thing that depends on beta just comes out front. So limit uh, time goes to infinity of the sum over i and j e to the minus beta sum of the energies in i plus e j times one over t times the integral of zero to t e to the minus i t e i minus e j dt. And now comes the crucial uh, way in which chaos intervenes because what we say is that for a chaotic system, um, you typically have no uh, degeneracies in the energy spectrum. So this uh, expo exponent here cannot be zero unless i is equal to j. So you're really uh, looking at the same state, which means that this integral is actually proportional to the Kronecker delta, delta ij. And uh, this late time limit or this late time average of the spectral form factor just collapses onto the diagonal. In other words, it becomes e to the minus two beta EI, which uh, you recognize of course is nothing other than the partition function itself at temperature two beta. And let me say that this is, first of all, it is strictly greater than zero, it's non-zero. So the point being that it's not equal to zero. And if we wanted, we could also do some counting and we would find that this thing goes like order e to the entropy s, 
okay? Because roughly speaking, um, this uh, sum will be supported only within some microcanonical window. Uh, and within that microcanonical window, you, you typically find order e to the entropy states, okay? Now, the, what I've shown you here is so far is some sort of almost trivial manipulations. The point is, however, that in a unitary finite size uh, uh, Hilbert space quantum system, the point is that the late time average of something like uh, K beta cannot be zero. In fact, we have some estimate for what size it should be. It should be of order e to the s. And what we will find um, is that this is actually in tension with what gravity would predict, but we'll get there next, okay? So what people usually say is that properly normalized, we actually see things like Z, Z star. So this spectral form factor averaged over some time window divided by the uh, square of the partition function at inverse temperature beta, okay? According to our analysis, this should be Z of two beta, okay? Divided by Z squared of beta. Now, um, this factor is still of order e to the s. Each partition function by the same token is of order e to the s. So the square is e to the minus two s. So this thing should be of order uh, e to the minus s. So in other words, um, we want to say that the signature that we're after right now and that we want to now compare with what, what gravity tells us is the fact that properly normalized, the spectral form factor at very late times can go to be very small, namely it can be of order e to the minus entropy, but it must be non-zero. Okay, and so um, this, what, what people, what you've probably already seen, you know, um, often you find nowadays these pictures where, where we write the log log plot of this quantity. So we write something like the logarithm of time and the logarithm of K. And we have some sort of uh, order one initial value and some decay. Okay, so this is order one. Okay. Notice that one of the reasons why we normalize it like this is that for um, early times, uh, so, the, the, the spectral form factor itself, not its time average, the spectral form factor itself, which depends on time, so k of t, right? Um, if I normalize it by the square of the partition function that at time zero, it is an order one quantity. So this decays for a while, and then eventually, however, it starts rising again and saturates, and it saturates precisely at this order, which is e to the minus s. And um, again, what really happens is, I'm sure you've, Right about this as well is that you have some smooth behavior, but in actual fact, at a certain point, this becomes very noisy and it essentially fluctuates around the value of e to the minus s. So this, this is what, what uh, one expects actually in a unitary quantum system. And all of this here, um, this, this whole phase here is what some people might call quantum noise. So in some sense, you can't suppress the quantum fluctuations completely. This has to be there. And I want to discuss actually this quantum noise today in precisely using this, this handle of, of ergodicity, okay? But this is just a bit of a preview. The most important thing of uh, what we've discussed so far is the idea that um, just starting from this observation of, of Hawking and Bekenstein that the Hilbert space of the black hole is finite, um, and putting with that the idea that it should still be described by unitary evolution gives us the constraint that at very late times, there should be some sort of quantum noise rather than a completely vanishing signal. And without sort of uh, trying to kill the suspense too much, let me now tell you that what gravity actually gives us at least naively is a signal that is strictly zero. Okay, so I want to show how that works now. Um, and the point is now that what I said, the sharp signature um, of, 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 of this tension with unitarity is precisely to be found in this region. Namely that gravity seems to actually contradict or give an answer that is not com compatible with these constraints. So note that a very similar, very similar situation, a very similar story actually could be told 
for two point functions to be concrete and higher point functions also if one wanted to. So is this, is this okay? I'm gonna now say a couple of words about gravity. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So let's, let's think about gravity. What, what is gravity saying about these kind of quantities? Well, this idea that we are just looking at the, uh, that the analytically continued partition function, well, uh, this idea actually gives us a way of calculating what's going on in gravity because we actually know um, ADS CFT uh, gives us a very simple way of computing Z of, Z of beta. So we can do that and then we can analytically continue it And we can, we, can, we can actually just write down what it tells us and we can see, does it actually work? Well, um, this can be done actually for general ADS, but for concreteness, um, let me tell you just about the ADS3 example. And one, of, one reason why I'm taking the ADS3 example is that actually there is a very uh, explicit calculation known um, but roughly speaking, that calculation goes through also in ADS4 and ADS5 and so on. So, so what I'm writing here, in fact, for now, um, so Z of beta is supposed to be calculated by evaluating the on-shell action of the black hole, which in three dimensions is the PTZ black hole at inverse temperature beta. But this is not all, this is sort of just the classical answer, but we want the semi-classical answer. So we get actually a factor that I'm calling delta of beta. So this delta of beta is a one loop determinant. So fluctuations around this black hole. So in particular, if we just want ADS3 gravity, then it will be the one loop determinant of gravitons. Mm -hmm. And, and this first factor is just the, the on-shell action of the Euclidean BTC, BTZ, on-shell action of um, Euclidean BTZ. All right. So this first part, the on-shell action of the Euclidean BTZ is a very simple calculation um, because that is just sort of evaluating the, uh, the, the, the three-dimensional Einstein-Hilbert action on the BTZ solution. The thing that is not actually so easy to calculate is really quite a lot of work is this one loop determinant. And so when I said that this, this uh, story works in all dimensions, um, it is actually quite painful to write expressions for these one loop determinants, but uh, to some extent it can be done, but I will also, once, I'm, once I've completed, completed the three dimensional example, I will tell you precisely what is the feature that, that is most important, then we will understand that this feature is present in all dimensions in, in the ADS computation. So basically we're asked to do some sort of uh, one loop expansion of the uh, semi-classical path integral um, in ADS3, okay? And in particular, what we, what we would like to do is we would like to calculate some sort of um, integral uh, over all possible metrics with the right boundary conditions, S of G, where the right boundary condition is that the space-time boundary DM is a two torus. And why do we say it's a torus? Because we want it to be a torus uh, with modular parameter, uh, parameter tau, which is, well, you have to normalize it by two pi, but that's just convention, um, theta plus I beta. So we want to be on a finite spatial cylinder, uh, sorry, finite spatial circle if you want, and we want periodicity in imaginary time. Okay, and so this computation actually has been done, um, has been done for the first time using indirect means by Brown and Eno in the 1980s, but it has been done just as a brute force calculation by John B. Yin and Maloney. And um, to cut the story short, uh, what we find is precisely the following. We find that this Z BTZ computed in this way, beta and T times Z star BTZ um, of B 
beta and t. And I think now, Sayantan, you're probably happy with my notation, right? But pe people like to call this z star, so I'm, I'm just going with convention. And they find that this is actually, uh, oh, mm, sorry, yeah. And k, k is actually just a sort of a gravitational coupling constant, but we can express it. Um, it's actually the ADS length divided by 16 pi g Newton. Uh, okay, my bad. So um, this shows up, of course, also in the result. And you can show that this is, gives you the exponential. So this comes from the on-shell action part, 16. In the end, it boils down to 16 pi squared beta divided by beta squared plus t squared times this k. And then the one loop determinant gives a prefactor that goes like one over t to the six. So if so, let me call this, uh, maybe call this thing k uh, uh, gravity um, of beta t, okay? And so as you can see, because this thing uh, decays like one over t to the six, okay? If I average this over time, then what this is saying that this k of beta gravity averaged over time and the way above um, strictly goes to zero. Okay, so that's a problem. Um, in other words, uh, ADS3 gravity, semi-classically uh, violates this constraint. Okay. Um, let me maybe just remark briefly that, uh, of course, this can also be calculated if it can be done in three dimensions, it can be also done in two dimensions completely explicitly. And so if I actually do this Z, Z star in JT gravity, okay, um, this will actually, uh, let's say for large time scales, T much, much greater than beta, um, you know, here, here I, I was also sending this, this, this uh, average time scale to infinity. So let me make the average time scale. Yeah, let, let, me, let me just look at the thing itself for time scales much, much greater than beta. This will also decay like one of a T cube. So it will also go to zero. So also is intention. That's not good. Um, but more generally, okay, what's the point? So first of all, let me, let me now give you an argument why this is to be expected also in higher dimensional ADS where the computation is much, much more painful and I don't think has been done in quite as much detail. Um, but uh, but um, let me then also tell you why people even say that this has to do with information loss. So the point is that this uh, decay is actually a generic consequence of having a spectral density that is continuous. This decay follows if rho of E, the spectral density is continuous. And the continuous spectral density, uh, we should say, um, is a feature, generally speaking, of these gravity duals. So, so, so we can expect um, similar behavior, uh, similar behavior, in higher D. But it also means that in some sense, uh, the real, real spectral density, so the full, let's say full non-perturbative quantum gravity spectral density, uh, because it's a finite number of states, right? It's a Hilbert space with a finite number of states. It should just be a sum of delta functions. It should just be a sum of delta um, E, minus EI supported at the eigenvalues of the, um, of the Hamiltonian in question. So somehow um, what we have learned is that semi-classical gravity washes out, forgets about the discreteness of the spectrum. So to write it in a, in a more, um, well, it loses, loses the information on the discreteness. Of rho of E. 
And it's in that sense that um, we, we can associate this with, with information loss. So to recap, what we've done so far is we have, um, we have stated just from, from, from some very general principles uh, that in a unitary quantum system with a finite Hilbert space, uh, this spectral form factor must have some remaining irreducible quantum noise at late time. We have then taken our first sort of naive guess as to how in something like ADS-CFT duality, one might compute um, the spectral form factor. But what we found is that at least in the late time limit, something is going wrong. Something uh, is in tension with, with how a generic uh, uh, unitary system needs to behave. And in fact, we have already been able to put our finger a little bit on what the problem is, namely that semi-classical gravity seemingly does not have access to the discreteness of the spectrum. And this is a very precise sense in which it loses information about the microstructure. So now um, what I want to spend the rest of my time on um, is uh, basically to give you an update on the story. Namely, um, we can actually say a lot more about the discreteness of the store of the spectrum from semi-classical gravity, but this comes um, in some sense at the uh, cost of some other associated puzzles, um, which are very interesting and which I think uh, find their natural resolution in terms of this ergodicity idea. So um, let me give you an outline of the solution, which I will then um, and try and, and, and explain in some more detail. Okay, so this is really the outline. So I've described to you the problem in some detail. Now let me tell you the outline of what may be the solution or what we believe is the solution. So if we look at this uh, spectral form factor, maybe I'll draw it one more time um, sort of from a generic uh, perspective. And uh, let me highlight a few features of this, which will be useful. So note, um, please remember that I'm still thinking about log time and log K. So um, just to say that this initial decay, basically this initial decay here is something that seemingly is compatible with semi-classical gravity. So the interesting, the interesting story is sort of to the right of this. And from, um, quantum ergodicity point of view, the time scale, this time scale is actually a famous time scale and it is known as the Taulis time scale. For now, this is just a name. We will put some more meat on this as the, time, as the talk goes on. And then the, there is this uh, sort of rising part here. And at some point it seems to plateau again at order e to the minus s. And this transition um, is, is known as the Heisenberg timescale. Also, these are actually, in some sense, very well-known uh, generic features that uh, the quantum chaos community has been talking about for quite a while. And what we're doing is we're sort of giving them meaning and now in this new context of uh, black hole physics. So what this low rising part of the slope corresponds to? Well, um, it's actually, there's a very nice story that can be told here. Um, this is what one usually chalks up to what's known as level repulsion. And the slope itself is a, a very beautiful quantity because it turns out to be extremely universal. So I was sort of careful only calling it a rising part not to bombard you with too much detail, but in fact, it's linearizing. The point is that this thing can be seen to be proportional to time t, and the, even the proportionality factor we can say a lot about. In fact, there are only a very few choices of what this proportionality factor can be. There are only very few universality classes. But what one often says is that um, in some sense, this is where the system first finds out that uh, it has the, the quantum chaotic property that eigenvalues don't want to be degenerate. Mm -hmm. And this is very physically expressed in the fact that two eigenvalues actually repel each other. 
And the force of this repulsion, one can think of this as a mechanical problem. The force of this repulsion is a universal uh, uh, um, quantity. And that gives rise to the fact that this rises linearly and with a very specific coefficient. Okay. And, this and then, yeah. Please continue. Yeah. Okay, so then um, in, the, in this phase here, in this, uh, so, so one might call this, uh, so our high energy community has actually been sort of rebaptizing this thing as the ramp. So often we hear about the ramp and this thing here is the plateau. And both of these I would like to talk about um, for the remainder of this talk. And um, what I want to convince you of is the following picture. So how do we understand this in gravity? So um, for this, I will just copy paste this uh, figure. Um, Plato behavior is the outcome of uh, the maximal chaotic city or something else? So say, say again, please, exactly what, what you said. Plato behavior, this Plato type of feature, is this? Uh, no. No, this is not maximal chaos. Okay. No, uh, or, or rather it has no specific relation to maximal chaos. Um, it, it is there in, in every chaotic system. But of course, there is an interesting question to be asked, which we will get to later on, um, whether, you know, how, how is this universal story specialized in some sense to the gravitational context? And maybe we can discuss it then again. Um, I believe it's, well, the answer is that we should be thinking for this question, we should be thinking more about this time scale. The Heisenberg time scale is really something that's rather, um, that, that, that's rather universal. You should also be careful that the Taulus time itself already. So, so if you really want to, okay, if you really want to know this, so the Taulus time, for example, for SYK, uh, according to our work, is actually something that is polynomial in n. It's actually um, n to the one half log n. And if you want to talk about maximal chaos, I think you're more interested in something like the scrambling time. And this is just log n in SYK. So, so your question about maximal chaos is a question about really early time physics from, from this perspective. Yes. Okay, so, um, so what is the resolution? Well, the point is that uh, in, in gravity, the picture is now this, that this thing in red here is really our Z squared BTZ. Or the, or the semi-classical partition function. That is decaying and that's fine. But if you let time progress, in fact, we need to take into account uh, the contribution. So if you want, this is like two ADS spaces, both of which have a, a finite size boundary. So this is like one ADS black hole space with direct product with the second one. You know, for each factor of Z, I have one partition function, but this is sort of, if you want the Euclidean product of two space times, it's a two boundary object because I have Z squared. Okay, I have two boundaries, but it's actually just the product of two black holes if you want. It turns out that there are actually other semi-classical configurations, which we have not previously thought to include in the semi-classical pattern rule, and they become important around about the Taulus time. And those are two boundary geometries. So we have, well, I have my two boundaries here, but these two boundaries are not distinct. Now they're actually connected. So this is what gives rise to this plateau phase. And this is what, what we nowadays would call the two boundary wormhole, Euclidean wormhole. Okay, and there is actually also interesting topology going on. And um, for this, Plateau, this is in some sense, uh, uh, well, let's just say, let me call it the second saddle. And how to think about this in gravity is actually one of the open problems. I have some ideas about it, some results, but I don't have such a clear picture to draw right now. The only clear picture one could draw would somehow be uh, a two boundary wormhole with uh, extremely complicated topology 
um, and many multi-boundary wormholes as well. So, so there is no simple picture to draw for the time being, but I do have a very nice simple description for which I want to tell you about the second saddle. Okay, so this is the outline. Um, and so now um, I, at this time, I also usually say something about, uh, you know, you've also heard about these recent, so these are Euclidean wormholes. These are in particular what people call Euclidean wormholes. Okay, but uh, you have no doubt also heard about uh, recent progress on something called replica worm wormholes and the page curve. And I want to say that so far at least, um, the Euclidean wormholes and the replica wormholes are different. There are, there are actually subtly different objects uh, and they are also in some sense responsible for different effects. So the replica wormhole supposedly is the one or has been shown to be the one that uh, basically gives rise to a unitary page curve um, and they, they kick in at the page time. And one thing, for example, you could think about is that the page time, okay, is not the same as the Taoist time in general. So I just want to make this, this sort of announcement that uh, my talk today is about Euclidean wormholes. I'm not going to have much to say about replica wormholes, but in fact, it would be interesting whether maybe in some sort of more um, general framework, conceptually more powerful framework, uh, one could actually make a more a closer connection between replica wormholes and, and uh, Euclidean wormholes. Okay, so um, good. So, so much for uh, the introduction and in some sense an outline of what's to come. Maybe this is a good time to ask if there are questions. Any questions, comments, anyone? So then um, let me tell you uh, something about um, spectral definitions of quantum chaos or spectral signatures of chaos. And because I already had questions of this kind, I mean, I also want to say that this is a definition of quantum chaos, which is in fact, uh, more or less independent of these stories about scrambling and Lyapunov exponents and so on. In fact, one that is older um, and perhaps more robust, this is the one that goes back to Wigner, Dyson, Meta and, and people like that. So the main idea is that um, I'm interested now uh, in a specific quantum system, some quantum chaotic system. Of course, in the end, I want to think about my black hole, but we could also think about other uh, quantum chaotic systems, such as, for example, um, let's say uh, chaotic billiards or, or you know, a very complicated nucleus or something like this. So let us actually ask about the following question. Let us ask about the probability P of omega in a statistical sense of finding two energy levels at a distance omega. So this is now the probability, oops, probability of um, finding two energy levels a distance delta apart, a distance omega, excuse me, apart. Okay, what does it mean? It means that, um, let me take my quantum system and let me look at its energy spectrum. So now I have a list of all the energy eigenvalues. I will then make a histogram, which of course, like all histograms, requires me to define some bin width delta E. Okay, so I define some bin width delta E, but I'm still talking about one single quantum chaotic system. So histogram of energy levels. And what I will do is the following. I will fix myself to be at some uh, energy level, let's say the, the 173,000 energy state. And I will scan to the right uh, in energy. 
And I will ask how many levels fall into my bin, let's say a bin that is very small. Then how many energy levels fall into the second bin? I will draw a histogram like this, right? And I continue. I, I draw these things uh, um, bin by bin. And what I will find is actually, let me first draw a continuous curve and then let me tell you why I actually I'm drawing a continuous curve. I will draw something like this. I will find a histogram now that is a very good discrete approximation of this curve. Okay, let me just uh, sort of artist's impression wise draw this. In one single quantum system, okay? And in fact, the curve that I have drawn even has uh, a formula to it. It's actually, um, for many cases, it is pi times s times e to the minus pi fourth s squared. And s is actually my energy difference. Sorry, I should have not called this energy, but o omega, right? This is energy difference. And S is energy difference, but it's measured in special units, namely delta. Delta is the mean level spacing. So I just take the total width of the, the spectrum. I take the number of states. And so the total width divided by the number of states is, is the approximate distance between two levels. All right, so, so if I actually um, draw this as a function of, uh, of, uh, of omega over delta, then this curve will have a maximum at s is equal to one, s is omega over delta. And what I want to um, tell you is that the most interesting feature is the fact that, first of all, a single quantum chaotic system, again, I should say a single system has this, has this property of its spectrum, okay? But uh, it has in particular the feature that the probability of finding two energy levels at zero separation goes to zero. Okay, so this is this is already one manifestation of this level repulsion. You know, two levels just don't want to be on top of each other. So, right, very good. So this is what it is. Um, so we call this level repulsion. But it, what it also means is that actually implicit in this curve is the fact that energy levels are actually not fully independent, right? There is a certain amount of correlation of energy levels uh, in a quantum chaotic system. So the fact that there is an energy level at some place makes it much less likely that there is a second energy level nearby. Okay, it becomes likely again once you're at this average separation, and then it decreases again in likelihood. Okay, and so this is in some sense really the strongest indication of quantum chaos. And what we want to do is, or what I would like to spend some time on is to tell you that, okay, so as I said, this means that there exist correlations, okay, correlations in row of E1, rho of E2. And what I want to tell you about is what actually quantitatively these correlations are. And uh, I will tell you that it's precisely those correlations which give rise to the ramp and the non-perturbative correlations that give rise to the plateau. And furthermore, that in order to understand these correlations in gravity, this is precisely where these Euclidean wormholes come in. Okay, so now, um, yeah, please, please ask your question. So is, if I'm not wrong, this probability distribution is called Wigner's surmise. You're not wrong. Yeah. I can write it. Uh, I was going to say that now uh, also because there's something extremely interesting about Wigner's surmise, which actually now makes connection with a question that Sayantan was asking earlier. How did Wigner actually surmise this level spacing distribution? What did he actually do? Well, Wigner actually just thought very hard and what he calculated, he, he asked the question, um, what is P of omega for a, a matrix, for, so for a, a Hamiltonian, for a Hamiltonian, if I consider it as a random matrix, so that is sampled 
from a distribution. And the distribution that gives rise to this is the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble that is sampled from GOE. Well, the answer is precisely, the, the answer is Wigner's surmise above. Okay, so what are we saying here? So now we're saying something that's quite deep, in my opinion. What we're saying is that despite the fact that we, we have only ever looked at individual Hamiltonians, so like, for example, one black hole or um, one nucleus, um, in fact, there is some quantities, namely spectral correlations, which are extremely well approximated in this sense that I showed here. They're extremely well approximated by a function that is actually a property of um, an ensemble of Hamiltonians. And if you want, you could make this mathematically more precise. You could say, let me consider a limiting procedure in which I take the you know, number of eigenvalues large and the, the size of the, size of the, the, the boxes uh, bins to be smaller and smaller. And you will get a better and better approximation of this continuous curve. So Wigner at the time, probably for some very good reasons, but essentially it was a guess. I mean, that's also reflected in this name. He surmised that this should be the distribution. Uh, nowadays, we understand why this is the case. At least uh, we have a very good understanding of it. Maybe not, not yet a completely mathematically rigorous proof type understanding. But for a physics, for a physicist, uh, for physicists, notions of rigor, we actually understand this. But what I wanted to say is that because of this approach that I'm outlining here, okay, we do not actually have to ever really think about a fundamental ensemble of things. We never really have to invoke the fact that there is some Hamiltonian that is sampled from an ensemble. It's enough for us to say that we have a quantum chaotic system and we are asking about correlations uh, in the spectrum of a quantum chaotic system, which are effectively well described by an ensemble. But that doesn't mean that there is an ensemble. I hope that's clear, right? This is, this is difference and it's uh, in this context an important difference, okay? So let me outline how we understand this and uh, then finally what, the, what this has to do with wormholes. And then I think uh, that will be the end of my lecture. It will still take some time. I hope it's okay if I can take another, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. So again, I assumed if nobody is telling me no, then that means yes. So let me tell you, where does this universality of Wigner's surmise come from? So this is something that uh, with my collaborator, Alex Altland, I call causal symmetry breaking. And the universality of, of uh, RMT physics, so RMT random matrix theory, universality of RMT. So again, uh, the idea is that what we would like to calculate is uh, something, um, you know, statistical about the spectrum. So we would like to define this row of E well. So row of E of course is just going to be a trace over Delta of E minus the Hamiltonian. Okay, we have sort of said this before um, and we can write this in the energy eigenbasis as Delta E minus EI sum over all eigenstates. Time. So, um, what we therefore really would like uh, to know about is the quantity that, let me call it R2, where I have two energies, E1 and E2. So this should be like the spectrum evaluated at E1 and the spectrum evaluated at E2. Now, the way to do it is actually to use the spectral resolvent. The spectral resolvent allows us to write a very convenient uh, expression for rho. So the spectral resolvent itself depends on one energy and um, there is usually an I epsilon. So if I write plus, I'm actually considering E in the upper half complex plane, so plus I epsilon. And if I write the minus in the lower half plane, um, minus I epsilon. 
So very explicitly, this is the operator trace one over E plus or minus I epsilon, as I said, minus H. Notice H of course is an operator, same here. Okay. And so then um, because of uh, the usual identities for these kinds of operators, we have the fact that rho of E is actually uh, minus plus one over pi times the imaginary part of the trace of one over E plus minus minus H. Okay. Why? Be yeah. Okay. That, that's that's just how it works, right? Because trace of trace of one over x as an operator is just uh, the principal value integral of one over x. So you should think of this as some kind of uh, uh, distributional identity. Okay. Minus plus i pi times delta of x. So if I take the imaginary part of this guy, right? Uh, sorry. Um, put the tra trace in front of the whole thing. If I take the imaginary part of this guy, then it filters out just the delta function, delta function E minus H. And what is the trace of delta function of E minus H? Well, that, that was my row. Okay, so I can, I can extract row um, from this resolvent. Should I be able to calculate the resolvent? And of course, you know, the reason why we introduce it is that in fact, we are able to calculate the resolvent. Okay, but what I would like to say is that um, there is actually uh, an object that is even more advanced, if you want. <laughs> um, that's even cooler if, than the resolvent, in particular, if we're interested in non perturbative physics, which we are. So, non perturbative physics, in fact, um, suggests, okay, or it turns out to be helpful to instead consider something like um, the determinant of E plus minus minus the Hamiltonian, okay? And I will call this maybe calligraphic D of E plus minus. What does this spectral determinant allow me to do? Well, let me just say that uh, I will just give you one example. Let's note the following. If I take the derivative with respect to the energy of the determinant of E minus H, and I divide this guy by the determinant of E prime minus H, and I set E equal to E prime. Well, what do I get? I get our good old friend, trace one over E minus H. Okay, how does it work? Well, remember that if I take the derivative of the determinant with respect to its argument, I get back the determinant times the trace of the inverse of the argument of the determinant. But um, I have normalized this by one over the determinant. So, so the determinant factors cancel and I'm only left with the trace of the inverse of the argument of the determinant. So that's this thing here. So this is my spectral determinant. So, um, sorry, this is my spectral resolvent coming from my spectral determinant, excuse me. Okay, so in some sense, it's just an integral or it's, you know, it's just one derivative away from the quantity that we want. On the other hand, it turns out that uh, for, for this non-perturbative story that we would like to pursue, these spectral determinants are really the quantities to go for. Okay, so what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start building a theory um, of spectral determinants. And this theory of spectral determinants will turn out to be an extremely powerful way of thinking about a quantum, a quantum chaos. And maybe uh, one more remark, of course, uh, all of this has to do with the statistics of the spectrum. So in order to talk about the spectrum, it is sort of, well, it's maybe not that unnatural to think about a determinant, which is like a very uh, beautiful mathematical repackaging of the spectrum, right? Because you know, this depends just basically on the spectrum, very cleanly depends on the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so um, any questions? Any questions, please ask. 
Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm just saying things that are too elementary or if, if, no, if no, no, uh, I've, you I've already to, lost everybody. No, you are going completely perfect. I, I am sure. All right. So then um, what I'm going to do basically is I'm going to write a field theory for these D, D objects here. That is my goal. That sounds a bit uh, abstract now, but we'll get there. Um, step by step. So the, the first move is very simple. The first move is actually, so our basic move will be this. Okay. We're going to say that this spectral determinant D of E uh, plus or minus, we can actually write this as an integral. And writing this as an integral, um, we just write it as an integral over Grassmann numbers, uh, E star E, eta star eta e to the i, eta star, e minus h, eta. What have we used here? We've used the fact that h is a d by d matrix. Just think of the Hamiltonian as a, as a matrix because d is the dimension, the finite dimension of our Hilbert space. Remember, this was, uh, this was already our starting point. And now um, a large dimensional Grassmann integral, right? So if I integrate over this Gaussian integral with Grassmann numbers, I just get the determinant of the operator that's, that's sandwiched here, the kernel. Again, this is sort of um, basic property of Gaussian integrals. Um, so eta, let, let me write them once, eta mu star and eta mu are D complex Grassmann numbers. Hmm. Grassmanns, okay. But of course I can also write uh, a, a similar object where I integrate now over bosonic fields. So I can write one over the determinant. Remember we learned in our elementary quantum field theory courses that one over a determinant, that's actually what you get. If you do a similar thing, but now with uh, complex bosons. So e to the i phi star of e minus h phi. And I've left some space because unlike Gaussian integrals with fermions, the ones with bosons, they actually need to uh, have a convergence factor. And in this case, because I have a plus sign here, plus i times plus i is minus one. I need to put a plus one here, but I could of course have put a minus one here, then I would have had to put a minus one here. So what we've actually calculated here is one over d plus e plus. We could have also calculated one over the, the determinant of e minus, and then we would have had to do this maneuver with the different signs here. So, so now phi uh, is uh, phi, phi mu star phi um, are um, d c numbers, not Grassmanns, just ordinary numbers, just bosons if you want. So what we can do is we can write um, down uh, the basic quantity that we need. And that quantity is actually one that depends on four energies. And for historical reasons, these four energies are actually denoted in this context, context as Zs. But you know, they are, they are just, think of them just as energies, E1 up to E4. So this thing is now, it's, it's just a ratio of determinants. So it's that Z1 minus H, that Z2 minus H, and then the whole thing divided by that Z3 plus minus H times that Z3 minus minus H. Okay. And um, this can be written using our trick as an integral over a graded object now. So we have four D dimensional object. I call it capital Psi, Psi of E to the, uh, well, exponent of I, Psi dagger C hat minus H or Psi. I will explain the notation, of course. 
So psi uh, is a graded vector, a graded vector, okay? Because it has um, 2D fermionic directions and 2D bosonic directions, okay? It's very in, um, um, in easy to see why, because I have D fermionic directions for this determinant, I have D fermionic directions for this determinant and D bosonics for this and D bosonic for that. So that makes 2D fermions, 2D bosons, and I can pack them into one graded vector, psi. Now, uh, Z hat is just a matrix, which is the diagonal matrix of Z1 up to Z4. It's just a compact way of writing that. Um, and H4, is just four times the Hamiltonian, right? Because I have one, two, three, four Hamiltonians. Okay, usually actually, if you look at the literature, people don't even bother writing this four, they write it like this, but what they do mean is really four copies of this. Okay, so let me once be explicit. Okay, and so um, I'm going to put a frame around this because this really is the basic object. Uh, why is this the basic object? Because I claim that this is the simplest combination of spectral determinants that allows you to calculate the spectral two-point correlation. So basically Z4 encodes, Z4 is a way to encode rho of E1, rho of E2. And in fact, um, the way that it works is um, that rho of E1 and E2, let me call that C2, for example, C2, C2 of E1 and E2. All right. So I can write C2 of E1 and E2. There are some factors of pi, which let, let, us, let us just forget them. Um, as a derivative with respect to E1 and E2, so double derivative of Z4. Ah, sorry, I call, yeah, good, good. I call them Zs, so let's be consistent. Z1 and Z2 of Z4, and then I need to set, set these things in equal in pairs. So Z1 will be Z3 plus, and what we will call this the first energy and Z2 will be equal to Z4 minus, and let me call this the second energy. Now, without going into the details, let me just promise you that it is extremely important that I have one of these in the upper half plane and one of these in the lower half plane. Um, roughly speaking, um, because uh, every time you have a row, what you really are talking about is the discontinuity across the real axis of the, of the, uh, the resolvent. So, if you want row row, you need to have twice the discontinuity, and that this, that that basically uh, translates to the fact that you need to have one of these arguments in the upper half plane, and one in the lower half plane. And interestingly, only for the denominator and the numerator, you can actually do what you want. Which um, okay, if I had more time, I would tell you a long story about why this gives rise to an interesting discrete symmetry. But in the interest of time, let me postpone that. Unless some of you are interested, in the end, you can of course ask me. But what is the crucial thing now is that this object now, Z4, uh, has what we call causal symmetry. So this is now just an observation. This causal symmetry means that we have um, we have a term, so I wrote it as psi bar, there was a term, right? Which was psi bar times h times psi. So let us look at that term. Okay, this is, uh, I'm, I'm omitting this four thing. So this psi bar h psi. So um, psi bar is some conjugate. So it's really psi dagger times some matrix L h psi. And this matrix L is actually nothing particularly fancy. It's just that I have different signs, right? I have, sometimes I have in the elementary determinants, sorry for scrolling back so much, but sometimes I have a plus sign, sometimes I have a plus sign, but once if I had a minus here, this would have been a minus sign. 
So L is just a matrix which has diagonal entries one, one, minus one, one, okay? It's just there for technical reasons. So, so this guy defines me my conjugate, but I can actually now rotate psi into T times psi, so long as T dagger LT is actually L. So L now takes the, 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 the role of some matrix. And if this is uh, of, of some metric, excuse me, this is like, you know, what, if you write elementary Lorentz transformations, you would put here the Minkowski metric. Uh, this, of course, Lorentz transformations have nothing to do with what I'm saying here, but just as a, as a reminder of something more elementary. But so long as my transformation psi, a T psi, uh, excuse me, psi goes to T psi, not psi bar goes to T psi, because of course, psi bar would, would go to psi dagger. Gosh, what am I doing? Psi dagger would be going to psi dagger T dagger. Anyway, so this is the requirement. So long as this is the case, our, our spectral determinant ratio, the Z4 is actually invariant. And this singles out, we can actually determine the group of transformations that does this. This is the group U1 comma one slash two. So there is a bosonic part Okay, that has to do with the phi directions, which has a Lorentzian metric. And then there's a fermionic part, which uh, is compact. So this is just U2, U1, comma 1. And this notation slash is the fact that it's graded, right? So I have directions which are Grassmann-like and I have directions which are bosonic. So that's, that's, that's it, that's our causal symmetry group. And what we will now show is that this symmetry is explicitly and spontaneously broken. And that's basically the crucial observation. So it's explicitly broken already because if Z is not actually the identity matrix, then it is explicitly broken. But notice that we're interested in, so what does, what does it mean if Z is not the identity matrix? Well, it means that, you know, Z, um, I can write it as a matrix, I guess. You know, this means that, um, you know, our first energy, second energy, third energy, and fourth energy are all the same. Then this is proportional to the identity matrix, okay? But, what we want to do is we actually want to look at energies which are um, different, but that are very small energy differences. We want to have very, very small energy differences. We want to look at energy differences which are of the order of the mean level space. So really that kind of one eigenvalue to the next. This is kind of the smallest energy difference you could possibly consider in such a quantum system. And that's why um, this is broken by delta Z, which is very, very small, namely of order e to the minus entropy. So it's explicitly broken, but it's weakly explicitly broken by a very small amount, which is very good because this puts us into smack the territory of effective field theories. They're very good for symmetries that have a weak explicit breaking and a strong spontaneous breaking. So now to the strong, strong um, spontaneous breaking. Okay, so this gives us um, now the idea of uh, the effective field theory of chaos. Right, so the, the point is now that I'm going to be able to, to uh, develop for you an effective field theory based on the symmetry group, which gives me the chaotic correlations. And because it's just a symmetry dictated effective field theory, it is universal in the technical sense of, 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 the, of the word, okay? So what we do now is we examine the following. We examine our theory, which is actually now the same thing that we had before, our psi star psi integral, okay? E to the i psi star z hat minus h psi, but I've drawn these brackets around it. What do I mean by these brackets? Well, by these brackets, um, I mean something like um, an energy binning. So there's some sort of smearing of energy. Remember when I first defined our histogram, right? I wasn't mentioning it explicitly, but certainly in, implicitly, 
this means that I'm smearing the energy a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm smearing a little bit my definition of what is an energy. So this is energy bins. So this, this, this is in some sense um, an averaging operation, but I do want to emphasize that it's not, again, an averaging operation that has anything to do with an ensemble average. There's still only one Hamiltonian. Okay, we are looking at four copies of it, but that's for technical reasons, but it's one Hamiltonian. There's not an ensemble of Hamiltonians, okay? Um, you could also mock up something where, where at least you, you, you choose some couplings to be random. You could put some random couplings if you want. This is already less elegant if you want, but, but why not? It's still not the same as a random matrix Hamiltonian. And so you could go down in randomness and you could finally arrive if you want. You can also do this thing for a full RMT, but that's just a way of, you can repackage basically the content of random matrix theory using the symmetry breaking. But as I said, the most interesting case is this, because this, uh, at least the first one here, this applies even for the case of an individual Hamiltonian without any, um, without any, uh, without any uh, notion of an ensemble. So now, good, well, I'm almost there because what we're going to do is uh, I want to explain to you one more structure, structural thing. These psi's, they actually have two kinds of indices. They have an index that I call A and an index that I call mu. The index A is what we like to call flavor. And it basically just tells me which determinant. Okay, so it's, it goes from one to four Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, okay? Um, and just tells me which determinant. And then we have this, which we call the color index. And mu is actually goes from one to D, the dimension of the Hilbert space. Let me remind you again, why this is the case. We, we go back to the construction. I think it's worth it. We, <clears throat> we introduced one set of fermions for this determinant. So there is a whole Hilbert space dimension worth of fermions for this. There's a whole Hilbert space worth of fermions for this. Whole Hilbert space of bosons, whole Hilbert space of bosons. So I have four copies of a vector which each has the dimension of the Hilbert space. So the Hilbert space index is my mu and A tells me which of the determinants this is associated to, all right? So then what we can do is we can actually integrate out these fermions in favor of what I would call mesons. And what we do is we sum over psi mu, but we leave the flavor index open, one over D. And this is basically um, what one might call causal mesons, okay? I call them mesons because it's precisely what happens in QCD if you think about chiral symmetry breaking, then these objects, the quark, um, quark anti-quark pairs are what we call the mesons. And here they're fermion anti-fermion pairs. Um, oh yeah, so that's why I should, should put a bar here. And so they are the causal mesons. And what we basically do is we develop the effective field theory, if you want the chiral Lagrangian, uh, chiral Lagrangian, of causal symmetry. Maybe you could call it a causal Lagrangian. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so this can be done. Um, it's, it's quite a lot of work, um, but it is standard work because it's really the same technology as Callan, Coleman, Bestomino taught us already in the 60s uh, for a general case. Now the symmetry breaking pattern of relevance is U1 comma one slash two broken to two subgroups, U1, U1 slash one times U1 slash one. So what I really get is I get um, a Goldstone effective field theory. And this Goldstone effective field theory is a super coset sigma model with target space. Well, precisely this U1 comma one slash two divided by U1 slash one times U1 slash one. So where are the wormholes in this story? Let me end by describing that. Okay, the point is that 
Now, if I wanted to um, describe, for example, um, um, the, 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 the correlation of two rows. So this, this will follow from the four determinants, but the correlation of the two rows. So it turns out that I can now develop um, an expression for this two um, spectral uh, resolvent correlation function that we started out with. And this turns out to be actually minus two. So let me call the fields in this manifold, let me call them B and B tilde, right? So you need to define some, some th those are the pions, those are the fields that parameterize that live on this target space. Um, so they are effectively degrees of freedom that, that encode the dynamics of this effective field theory, okay? And without constructing them now in detail, but they basically are a geometric construction because they follow just from this idea here of the super coset target space. So the two rep did the two um, um, resolving correlation function then trans transforms into twice the real part of um, a graded trace of B, B tilde times a graded trace of B tilde B Okay, evaluated in my sigma model. Um, and the point is that you can, roughly speaking, you can think of this as being rho of E1 and this being rho of E2. This is just a rewriting, how do you write this observable in the field theory? But the fact that um, I have two spectral densities actually means that I need to put a projection on the fermionic component plus here and I need a projection on the fermion component minus here. Actually, let's forget about the fermion. We just need, I, I already um, argued for you that you have to have these two different signs here. So this is really the only important thing. So this means that this comes from something that's continued in the upper half plane and this in the lower half plane, as I argued for you before. And um, the interesting thing is that already now, um, this means, what is this? So if I take, uh, just the um, first approximation where I contract this guy with this guy and this guy with that guy in that field theory, what I get is I get one boundary from this projector and I get a second boundary from this projector. I could label them with plus and minus. And each of these, these in some sense gives me, uh, oops, gives me a, um, gives me a, correlation between these two. So I have one row of E here and I have one row of E primed there and they are correlated. And interestingly, you can actually associate to the topology of this diagram, you can indeed uh, associate this two dimensional surface that I've already suggested here. So this is like, a, this is basically has the same topology as a two boundary wormhole. That's not a coincidence, although I'm not sure how much I can explain to you why this is not a coincidence, but let me just say that the way that this depends on energy is, is basically one over E minus E prime squared. And now if I take the Fourier transform of this diagram, so the Fourier transform of one over E minus E prime squared, well, if I take all the factors into account, what I get is I get root pi times T divided by Heisenberg time. So this is the linear ramp. This is the linear ramp, right? Because it's, it's a rise linear in T. And I told you that the coefficient is actually a specific coefficient. Now I've written it for you. It actually turns out to be, um, turns out to be root pi over the Heisenberg time is the correct coefficient. And in fact, what Alex Altland and I showed, so with, um, with Altland, I showed that this can actually be made very systematic and you can actually show that the Sigma model N boundary correlation function as a function of energy difference can be written as a topological expansion where um, you sum over all genuses with N boundaries in the Sigma model and you have a suppression that is S to the Euler number, basically 2G minus two plus N, uh, sum over all genuses. And 
our proposal, which we also uh, substantiated, is that this is actually this is actually to be compared to the um, um, Ena Orantin type Ena Orantin type um, topological expansion as used by by the Stanford group, so triple S, Saad, uh, Schenker, and Stanford um, in their solution, in their very beautiful geometric solution um, of the JT particle. Okay, so roughly so, speaking, what, uh, what I'm Julian, are you pointing towards this uh, 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 wormhole with, without leveraging story? Um, yes, that's certainly that's certainly tied in there. But um, what I'm saying is that uh, so so this paper here is actually not the wormhole without averaging story. This is the wormhole with averaging story. So the first, you know, the JT is a matrix model. But our interpretation already of that story is that you can actually think of that without having to necessarily associate it with an ensemble. Because what we're saying is that. Um, this Ena Orantin type topological expansion can actually map to the singular terms of our effective field theory of quantum chaos. Awesome. So what this is saying is that, in fact, the topology of the uh, of of this sigma model, which is just a matrix field theory, is actually in one-to-one -one correspondence with the topological expansion of Ena Orantin. Okay, up to the fact that we only get singular diagrams because those are the ones which are of of relevance in the ergodic limits. Yeah. And we can generate this topological expansion without ever having to do an ensemble average. Okay. So, okay. so this gives an alternative interpretation if you want on what's been going on with SSS. Namely that what this uh, Ena Orantin expansion does for us, it allows us to capture universal spectral correlations of quantum chaotic systems. Okay. And we have put this to the test, I should say. So we have we have put this to the test and we have looked at. So maybe let me end on this. Um, so bulk bulk signatures. Okay. What are the bulk signatures? So our proposal is basically that um, multi-boundary wormholes. So multi-boundary multi-boundary. Um, wormholes actually uh, are a new entry in the ADS-CFT dictionary. And the entry in the ADS-CFT dictionary is that multi-boundary wormholes allow us to um, basically encode, I mean, they encode holographically, they encode the universal ergodic um, spectral correlations of a quantum chaotic system, okay? And so what, for example, I mean, of course, the, 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 they, they are perfectly capable to speak for themselves, but what the, the more recent story of the, um, you know, um, gravity without averaging or uh, um, let's say these SYK for one realization papers, but what, what they are saying is also, you know, they also find, at least in some self-averaging sense, they also find wormhole type contributions in these in these theories which are manifestly not averaged. Okay. They also find other contributions, these so-called half wormholes. Uh, I didn't have there time might be to some disconnected topologies. I didn't have time to go into what these half wormholes mean in the present context, yeah, but yeah, the point is that yeah. um, you should expect to find something like these wormholes also in individual realizations. And that's, for example, is in fact borne out in this uh, recent paper by the Stanford group. So these ideas very much mesh with what, what we're saying here. Okay. So, um, uh, however, we are giving it, I mean, I mean, I should say that our story, you know, is by now uh, a year and a half old. I mean, there of course have been updates on it, but this general effective field theory we, we proposed uh, a while ago 
And I think that is very much in line with what's being said here, namely that these signatures, these universal signatures of quantum chaos, they are holographically encoded by the wormholes and they are present even in individual theories in the sense that I said that they give you spectral correlations, okay? So we have put this to the test, okay? And we have basically looked at, so, so um, we have looked at, uh, well, SSS basically have looked at JT gravity and have had this really beautiful work on solving the pattern goal and showing that these correlations exist. And we have looked at it also in minimal string theory, uh, which also um, basically allows us to extract these chaotic uh, universal correlations from what one would call two boundary wormhole. We looked as a little bit at these constrained instantons in higher dimensions. Um, of course, this is still more of an open story, but we found also that basically the leading singular contributions also agree with our EFT prescription. So, so far, I think this story is quite natural. So what we should think about, you know, these, these uh, multi-boundary wormholes, uh, possibly with interesting topology, okay? What, what they do is on each of these, we have like one, row of E and one row of E primed. Um, and these things just give us in some sense, the correlations between two spectral densities precisely in the chaotic sense. And that's their role in life for in ADS CFT. And it's uh, in some sense, the um, great conclusion really is that uh, if we allow, so semi-classics, semi-classics, plus um, wormholes, um, plus, you know, interesting topology. I mean, wormholes themselves are already interesting topology, but you might also have, you know, these handles and so on. Okay. Semi-classics plus wormholes plus topology actually allows, allows you to say much more about the microstates, microscopic information than one might have been inclined to hope. So microscopic data, there it is. Okay, so let me then just uh, close with two open problems. So what I have not really been able to tell you much about is uh, what should we say about the plateau in, in gravity? So in our effective field theory approach, um, this has to do with the so-called Altschule Andreas saddle. Okay. And um, another really big open problem is that our EFT, EFT also applies um, in higher D. So, so this suggests, for example, high dimensions, I mean, this suggests the question, you know, um, what's the, what's a minimal bulk story For example, uh, in uh, five-dimensional ADS, so n equals to four super young mills. Okay, these are these are two very nice open questions, I think. And so let me stop here and and um, take questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Julian, for very nice talk. Uh, uh, please unmute yourself and give a clap for Julian for uh, giving such a nice talk. And, uh, uh, now I uh, suggest please ask some questions or if you have any particular doubt you can hear. Um, yeah, so anybody? Shomo, do you have any question? No, sir. Shapurshi, Nilesh? No, sir, not right now. Partho? Uh, I have a uh... Your yeah, question. Please ask. So, uh, Professor, you, you mentioned uh, probably at the beginning that, that the time average of the spectral form factor uh, goes like order of e to the power exponentially to the power s. But what is s actually? I missed uh, s is the entropy, is the microcanonical entropy at energy e, for example. Or if you want, uh, Ed, you can call it the canonical entropy at inverse temperature beta. Yeah. 
Okay, so why is that? I mean, why is that? That's because, uh, sorry, or, or do you want me to say that or do you want to continue your question? Please, please continue. Uh, so you see, we've reduced it here because of this, this sort of projection, right? The integral here gives us the chronic delta. We've reduced it to a si single sum over the um, over, over over the spectrum, but the sum is weighted by this Boltzmann factor e to the minus two beta times e i. Okay, so they're rapidly exponentially de decaying for us for for the larger betas. So. Um, if we wanted to write, if we want to estimate how many terms are of order one, then uh, basically simple thermodynamic reasoning tells you that there should be exactly e to the s states in one uh, window that sort of contribute of order one. And after that, the thing is just too small to contribute anything meaningful to the sum. And the way to convince you of that is sort of, if you want ensemble universality. So you could also ask, how would you think about this in a microcanonical window? Well, you would put yourself at the average energy that corresponds um, to this inverse temperature. And then of course, in every microcanonical window, you have approximately e to the s states. They would all be equally weighted. So this would be order e to the s. Okay, so that's part one. Then part two is that um, if, I actually, um, if I actually normalize this, right? So I have still my thing that's order e to the s in the denominator in the numerator, excuse me, but in the denominator, I have uh, Z of beta all squared, but Z of beta, of course, itself is E to the minus beta EI sum over the entire spectrum. So that thing itself is order E to the S, okay? Yeah. So what I get is I have something that's order E to the S divided by something that's order E to the two S. So the quotient is E to the minus S. Okay. Yes. Good. Any other questions? Obishek, do you have anything to ask? No, sir. Thank you for this wonderful talk. Pleasure. Thank you for the compliment. Achin, do you have any question? Anyways, I don't want to uh, stretch it not long because He's already uh, given very long talk. I hope, uh, Julian, you have enjoyed to give this talk. And uh, yeah, like particularly we have learned a lot of new things uh, from this discussion. Uh, and thank you again for uh, giving this talk. So uh, once this will be uh, uploaded in the QASTM channel, I will share the link with you. Okay, thank you very much. So thanks for all your questions. Indeed, it was great fun talking to you. Thank you very much. So stay safe and healthy. So bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.